These are all real people in this video that were filmed this week through our team and, and people with real dreams and people with a true destiny. And every single person here has a great purpose and a great destiny that God called you to. The Bible says it is he who has made us in Psalm 100. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. Isn't it awesome to think that we didn't create ourselves. We didn't make ourselves. God made us. And God made us with a purpose in mind. And nothing, no, nobody ever makes anything. No man, no woman ever makes anything. Whether it's a chair, whether it's a, a phone, whether it's a piece of carpet. Nobody makes anything without a purpose. Without an intention for that thing that has been made. And in the same way, God made us, even in a greater way. If we, in our human flaws and human errors, still make things by design and make things with a purpose. How much more did God make you with a purpose? And did God make you by design? And God made you intentionally? And God made you to, to accomplish something and to be something great and to be the best that you could possibly be? And I want to encourage you today that there's greatness inside of you. Not just goodness, but greatness. Uh, there's, there's, there's such rich wealth inside of every human being on the face of this earth. And too many people fail to realize and believe in the value that they have. And therefore, we live beneath ourselves. We live below our privileges. We live below our future, below our destiny, below our potential, because we don't realize how valuable we are in God's eyes. We don't realize how great we are. So we try to be great in the eyes of others rather than discovering our greatness in the eyes of God. Now, let me say that again. Too often we fail as people to discover how great we are in God's eyes. So we seek the approval and the affirmation of others and we want to be great in their eyes. We've got to stop trying to be great in people's eyes and instead start discovering how great we are in God's eyes and then we won't try to get everybody to like us or to love us or to approve of us or to think we're great. We won't have to boast. We won't have to brag. We won't have to make ourselves feel superior to compensate for the feelings of inferiority that are on the inside of us. Many people are living under an inferiority complex. We're living under this mindset where we feel like we are less than what others are. We feel like we're less than what we compare to in this world. We're not, we're not as pretty as the world's models. We're not as successful as the world's businessmen. We're not as athletic as the world's, he, uh, as the world's uh, sports and athletic stars. We're not as, we're not as uh, recognized as the world's actors and actresses and celebrities. And we don't sing as well as the great singers. Yes, it's not you that's singing the halftime, uh, uh, the halftime concert at Super Bowl Sunday today. Yes, it's Katy Perry. But there's only one reason why Katy Perry is who she is, and that's because good parents put good understanding of God's Word inside of her and taught her to believe the Bible and all the songs that come out of her, whether she realizes it or not, comes from the wealth of the, of the treasure that God placed inside of her. And every human being, I believe, from Michael Jackson uh, years gone by to all of the great singers and all the great artists, were, were, they were created by God to be great worship leaders. They were created by God to be great speakers. The great orators and the speakers that, and the great business leaders in this world, many of them were called to be great preachers and great pastors and great songwriters, but they didn't realize their potential because they were feeling, in, they felt inferiority on the inside, so they tried to make themselves superior on the outside. Whenever you feel low, you try to raise yourself up. But when you lower yourself and humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, He will raise you up. And you don't have to try to prove anything to others. And you don't have to compare yourself to others. And I just love this scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, one of my life verses. And listen to what it says. But we have this treasure. Everybody say, we have this treasure. Say, I have a treasure. 
Now listen, where is this treasure? Is the treasure in your backyard? Is the treasure in your bank account? Is the treasure at your workplace? Is your treasure in your business? Is your treasure in your garage? No, look at where God puts this treasure. He said, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. And he said that the excellence of the power may be of God, not of us. In other words, no one can boast or brag that somehow you're the cause or the source of the greatness that is one day going to come out of you. Only God is going to get the glory. Only God is going to get the honor. Only God is going to get all of the attention because everything that is in you is designed by God to give him the glory. And when people are not connected to God, they want to take the glory for themselves. The world is a world full of glory seekers. Everybody wants glory for themselves. And that's why, who am I rooting for in the Super Bowl today? Whoever, whichever team is going to give most glory to God afterwards. That's the team I'm for. Whichever team is going to pray and whichever team is going to honor and whichever team is going to tithe to their local church. That's the team I'm working, I'm, I'm rooting for. So I don't know who you're for, but that's, that's who I'm rooting for. I want God to get all the glory in life. I want him to have, there's, listen, listen, there's greatness inside of you. There's treasure inside of you. I keep telling you about this. I keep telling you about this, I know. And some of you are going to be like, oh gosh, don't you have anything else to say? I do, but let me say this first. <laughs> that um, about uh, uh, 10 or 15 years, less than that, I think about less than 10 years ago, that um, they were digging under the highway, they were redoing a highway in Los Angeles on the 405, and they uncovered a treasure chest full of what was valued to be at least a half a million dollars in treasure in this little, in this treasure chest that they uncovered. And I love that story because it reminds me of the truth that that treasure had been there for years and years and years. It was only discovered recently, but it was, de- it was deposited there a lot long, a, a much, much longer time ago. And in the same way, what's about to happen in our lives is we're about to discover Amen. the treasure that is inside of us. It's already been deposited. It's already been buried. It's already hidden inside of you, but it's about to come out. Amen. And when it does, when you discover it, you are going to be the best version of yourself. You're going to be the best you. There is a you that is greater than the you that everybody sees right now. There is a you inside and there's a you outside. And right now the you, uh, the you on the outside is not the, has not reached its potential because you haven't discovered the you on the inside. And I want, to, I want to share a scripture with you that most people misunderstand. Most people don't get this verse, but I want you to get this verse. And, and I hope nobody will walk out of the church. Well, hardly anybody's here today. But so, you know, nobody's probably going to walk out of the church. But you guys are watching by webcast, and you that are here are you vitally important. I need you to double clap, and I need you to double, you know, praise, and I need you to double shout, and, you know, like, they're, ah. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but listen to this verse. I love this verse. First John chapter four, verse four. Every, anybody know it already? First John four, verse four. It says this, greater is he that is in you than he, put in the King James translation, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Everybody say, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now, we know theologically this means greater is God who is in us than the devil who is in the world, right? Theologically, that's what we've embraced as the meaning of this verse. But could it also mean, and the answer is yes. So when I say, because I've already studied it and researched it, you can study it yourself. You are of God, little children. He says, you are of God. That means you are a spinoff of God. Not not that you're, you're not God. 
Everybody tap your neighbor and say, sorry to disappoint you, but you're not God. You are. But he says you are of God or you are of the same stuff. You're made of his stuff. Little children. He's saying you're little children of God. You're little versions of God. Meaning, again, don't want to get too controversial here. You are not God, but we are a little chip off the old block. Right. When a horse has a a baby, it's a baby horse, not a baby cow. Right. Right? Right. When when a uh, you know, when a tiger has a baby, it's a baby tiger, not a baby elephant. Right. In other words, the baby is the is the smaller image or version of the, the parent. Uh, are you with me? I mean, how many mothers do we have here? Did you give birth to a cat or did you give birth to a little you? Right. Listen to what he's saying, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now, yes, I believe greater is the Holy Spirit that's in you than the devil and demons that are in the world. Right. But it also means and in our application today, greater is the you that is in you than the you that is in this world. Greater is the you that is in you than the you that this world sees. Greater is the you that God put in there that is hidden underneath all the junk and all the funk and all the uh, and, and, and all that negativity and all the mistakes you've made. Greater is the you that is down in you than the you that everybody sees right now. There is a you that everybody sees, but that's not the greatest you. The greatest you is in you. And what God is doing is he's carving, uh, he's carving and cutting and chiseling the stuff around the real you so that the real you comes forth. Well, I can put it to you this way. The block of marble that became Michelangelo's lar- larger than life sculpture of David laid untouched in the cathedral storehouse in Florence, Italy for decades, years, hundreds of years even. Several other sculptors had attempted to make something of it before Michelangelo discovered it when he was offered the opportunity. Michelangelo Michael, Michelangelo believed he could do something that nobody else could do. And what he did was he looked at the block of marble and he did not see what it couldn't be. He saw what it already was on the inside and he simply went to work cutting around what was already in there. He didn't see a block of marble that he could turn into a David. He saw a David that he then decided and determined he was going to cut the excess marble up from around him so that the real David would come out. And that's how God looks at you. God is the greater Michelangelo, right? Michelangelo simply saw a pattern that God had already started. Michelangelo saw David inside of that marble. Just as God sees the greatness that's inside of you, God placed greatness inside of you. He planted greatness inside of you. And we're determined in this series, we're determined in this this day, I'm determined this month, I'm determined this year that we're going to uncover and discover the greatness in you. Listen, the greatest teachers are not people who put things inside of their students. But rather, the greater the greatest teachers are those who pull things out from within their students, the treasures, the greatness. It's already in there. Greater is he that is in you. Greater is the you in you than the you that others see and the you that others see they're trying to define you by is not the final sentence on your life. Whatever others are trying to define you by 
is not what God defines you by. Because what defines you will confine you. And we need to make sure that we're not defined prematurely. We're not defined earlier than what we're supposed to be defined as. We're not defined by our mistakes. We're not defined by our shortcomings. We're not defined even by the first 20 years of our lives, 30 years of our lives, 40 years of our lives. Some of the greatest success stories are people that didn't even, weren't even discovered. They didn't even, nobody even knew them until they were 70 years old, 80 years old, 90 years old. Let me tell you something. Don't ever define yourself or confine yourself to what other people have defined yourself as. Because the greatness of God is already in you. And God's determined to bring it out from within. Can anybody say amen to that? Michelangelo was browsing through that area one day. His attention was drawn to that piece of marble one day. He walked around it and saw beauty in it. After a time, he told the shopkeeper that he was going to buy that piece of marble and he was going to turn it into what it was meant to be by God. The shopkeeper said, it's a fine piece of marble, but it has major flaws. And Michelangelo said, I know, I want it anyway. I see an angel in there and I must set it free. Michelangelo's exquisite work of David was the angel that he set free from the flawed marble. You see, God, it seems, sees an angel, a David, in the most unlikely places on the inside of you. God sees a David in you. Yeah, you've seen yourself as something less than a David. You've seen yourself as something less than an angel. The world has been telling you. And you know where most, you know where most of us get the worst definitions of ourselves from? Other Christians. Other Christians seem to want to label us and define us by one act, by one month, by one year. Don't define me by one year. God's not finished with me yet. Don't define me by one mistake. God's not finished with me yet. I'm not going to define you by one mistake in your life. I'm going to tell you it's a mistake. I'm going to let you know how to avoid the mistakes. I'm going to pray for you not to make the mistake. I'm going to teach you the consequences if you do make the mistake. But even if you, even if you reject all of the wisdom that God's trying to give you before that, God still won't give up on you. And God will still continue to work and chisel away. We sometimes are pushing God's hand off. No, God, don't chisel away at me. I want to stay the way that I am. Why have you seen yourself lately? Have you, have you been around yourself lately? Why would you want to stay the same? It's kind of a joke, but don't take it personally. I don't want to stay the same. I don't want to be where I'm at in my heart, in my mind, in my emotions, even my body. I don't want to be the same. The same a year from now is not an accomplishment. I want to be better. I want to be wiser. I want to be uh, smarter. I want to be, I want to be kinder. I want to be, I want to, I want to be the best version of myself. There's an old TV show, I forget what it was called, but it was, it was this show where there was, it was a person that was in multiple universes, and they were a different version of themselves in all these different universes. Does anybody remember that TV show? <laughs> Hama Hama Shama? Yeah. Well, I can't understand. Want to Believe is what it's called? Quantum Leap, Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. You know, God heal my ears. I want my ears to be better than they are today. But the point is, is that there's multiple versions in these in this TV show and another one that I'm thinking of as well is multiple versions of a person, multiple universes where the person is different. And and then and and here's the beautiful thing 
in our lives every day, there, even though we live in one universe, there are multiple versions of our lives that we can become based on the choices that we make. And each of us must choose to be the best version of ourselves that we can possibly be. There's a choice that has to be made. We're not just a, a victim of destiny. We are the part of shaping our destiny. We're not the ones who are called by God to just kind of be a byproduct of what happens to us in this life and in this world, but we're called to shape what happens in this world. I was saying the other day, we're not called by God to observe the current events and to be able to just read about the current events. God has created us. God has called us to help shape the current events, help create the current events rather than just rather than just read about the current events. Man, we, we shouldn't be going on Facebook to find out the current events of this world. We shouldn't be going on the Internet to find out what's happening in this world. We should be living our lives in such a way that we understand our place in history. We understand our place in the universe. We understand that God created us for a reason, created us for greatness, created us with a, de with a destiny, and that we are going to, as we yield to God, as we yield to his word, we're going to shape this, the current events in this world. We're going to create the current events in this world. We're not going to be shaped by them. Amen. We're going to shape them. Amen. And when things in this world get out of whack, we have the authority and the responsibility to pray them back into whack. Amen. If they're out of whack, that's where you, you pray them into whack, right? <laughs> we have the authority and responsibility to pray things back into the peace that God wants in this world. He said that we could pray for our leaders and all those that are in authority, that we may lead a peaceful, tranquil life in all godliness. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, he tells us that, that we can pray with that kind of authority. And we, and you know what? You know why? Most Christians are just watching things happen rather than realizing, wait a minute, we're the head and not the tail. We're above and not beneath. We're designed by God to make things happen, not just watch things happen and not be people that just wake up one day and say, what happened? Who's ready to discover the best you? Who's ready to choose the best version of yourself? Michelangelo said this in every block of marble, quote, in every block of marble that I see, I see, I see a statue as plain as though it stood before me, shaped and perfect in attitude and action. I have only to hew away the rough walls that imprison the lovely apparition to reveal it to the other eyes as mine already see it. He said, I already see, David. They say when you go to the, to, the, um, to the museum where the statue of David is, there are other works of art worth billions of dollars. You add it all up, it's worth billions. They say once you see the statue of David, you don't want to walk another step towards seeing any other art and any other sculptures in that entire gallery and in that entire museum. That's how stunning that statue is. That, and and even, even Michelangelo didn't make it himself. God was the one who created marble. Marble isn't man-made, it's God-made. God made marble. And, David's, and Michelangelo saw David in it. God made you. And he sees a David in you. He sees a Ruth in you. He sees... He sees greatness in you. He sees a Peter. He sees a Paul. Think about those men. They weren't, they weren't born as the best version of themselves. In Paul's first version of his life, what was he? He was a threat. He was an angry Pharisee, a self-righteous, legalistic Pharisee that when Christians came along, he hurt them. He accused them. He imprisoned them. Perhaps even killed some. He was a hater of Christians and a hater of Jesus. 
But then Jesus met him. And Jesus changed him. And he became the best version of himself. We don't remember him as Saul of Tarsus anymore. We remember him as Paul the Apostle. We don't remember Peter as the doubter. We don't remember Peter as we know he walked on the water and then he sank. We know that he cut people's ears off because he was out of control in his emotions. We know that he doubted the Lord. We know he denied the Lord three times. But do we really think that way about him? Or when we think of Peter, do we think of the man in the book of Acts that preached the first sermon and 3,000 people got saved? The next time he preached, the next day 5,000 people got saved. He walked into the beautiful gate in Acts chapter 3 and a man said, do you have anything for me? And he said, silver and gold we don't have. We didn't bring for you today. But what we do have, we give to you in the name of Jesus. Rise and walk. And he raised a man that was paralyzed at the beautiful gate for 40 years. Peter walked in there and in 40 seconds changed that man's life forever. That's the version that I have of Peter. I see Peter as the best version of himself. Not the doubter, not the denier, not the sinker, not the ear cutter offer. I see Peter as the apostle, as the preacher, as the baptizer. I see Peter as a man on whom this rock, whom this church will be built on this rock and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I see, I see that version of him and I see that version of you. Sometimes people have asked me, and not even asked me because they don't ask me, they talk about me. And they say, oh yeah, yeah, you know, and I've had people do this. Oh, if you go to that church or if you ever work at that church, man, that pastor is really hard on people. That's right. Because you've been soft on yourself long enough. Yeah. They say, why, why are you so, why do you, why do you expect so much from people? Because I see the David inside of you. I see the, I see the, the, the Ruth inside of you. I, I see that, that, that destiny inside of you. And so I'm going after it. I'm going to chisel away and God's going to chisel away. And we're not going to leave you the way you came. We're not going to leave you in the condition. Why don't I give up on people? Why for years do I not give up on people? Because I see the greatness in them. I see the destiny inside of them. And if I could be a little bit, a little patient and long suffering with people, how much more is God patient and long suffering towards each and every one of us and he has not given up on your butt he has not given up on your backside amen first samuel chapter 16 verse 7 says the lord does not look at the things people look at people look at the outward appearance but the lord looks at the heart man looks on the outside but god looks at the heart so you know where our focus needs to be in our lives on our heart You know where we need to be given attention to? What's happening in our heart. Because that's what God's looking at. What we need to be meditating properly on, the things things that we need to make sure are right in our lives are the things in our heart because it's only a matter of time before what's in the heart comes out of the mouth. And what comes out of the mouth is going to show up in our lives. Because what goes into the ears and what goes into the eyes is going to get into the heart. And what gets into the heart is eventually going to come out of the mouth. And what comes out of the mouth is going to come to pass. You know how powerful, you know how powerful your words are? Your words are so powerful, God said, death and life are in the power of your tongue. What gets into your ears is going to get into your heart. What gets into your heart is going to eventually come out of your mouth, and what comes out of your mouth is going to come to pass. That's why we need to watch what's going into our ears and watch what's going into our eyes, and we need to select carefully which version of ourselves we want to listen to Uh, the the reviews about do we want to listen to God's review about us that he loves us that he's for us that he's called us that he's destined us that he's chosen us that he's justified us that he's made us his righteousness he's made us his children he's made us the heirs of his kingdom he's made us the head and not the tail he's made us sons and daughters of him are we going to listen to that report about ourselves or are we going to listen to the lies of the devil and other people even well-meaning Christians that want to define you by your past and define you by your mistakes and define you by your limitations and define you if you stuttered growing up and define you if you were 
were, a, 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 if, you were a, if you were somebody who struggled with, with words or you struggled with school or you struggled with keeping your mind on things or maybe you struggled uh, in your sexuality, you, you, you weren't sure am I, and maybe you're still dealing with that but God is patient and God doesn't define you by what you're struggling with. God doesn't define you by what you're dealing with. God doesn't fi- define you by what you've done. He defines you by what He says about you. David was a shepherd, he was a hunter, he was a warrior, he was a general. This scripture that talks about David in 1 Samuel 16 verse 7 when God said, when, when Samuel thought it's got to be one of David's brothers, it's got to be the older brother that God's called to be king or maybe the second oldest brother, the third oldest brother. But David was like the eighth son of Jesse and he was the smallest, he was ruddy and he was young and he was inexperienced in the world's eyes, but meanwhile he was taking care of his father's sheep when nobody was looking. Meanwhile he was killing lions when nobody was looking, killing bears when nobody was looking because you know what? We don't need to be living for what other people will recognize. We need to be living for what God will recognize because God looks at the heart and it doesn't matter if nobody else sees you. You don't have to brag. You don't have to boast. You don't have to talk about yourself. We've got to learn the difference between being self-aware and self-absorbed. But the difference between self-aware and self-absorbed, what is the difference? A self-aware person understands his weaknesses and strengthens them. A self-absorbed person defends his weaknesses and hides them. Well, don't shout me down while I'm preaching good today. David was the younger that nobody thought could ever become something, but he already was something on the inside. And God saw what was in his heart. Did God see that David would make mistakes? Yes, but God saw his heart. Did God see that you would make mistakes? Yes, but he sees your heart. And you have to choose which version of yourself you're going to be the one that God sees or the one that people see. And it's only a matter of time if you make the choice to be that the best version of yourself. It's only a matter of time before you before you will become that on the outside, what you've chosen to be on the inside. Listen, what you've chosen to be on the inside, the best version of yourself, you'll eventually become on the outside. The best version of yourself. People will eventually see what God sees when you start seeing what God sees and when you start feeding your inner man, feeding him the word, feeding that greater version of yourself with God's word and God's love and God's promises, feeding your spirit, feeding your soul. David was a shepherd, he was a hunter, he was a general, he was a king, he was a poet, he was a champion. He was an outlaw, he was a musician, he was a prophet, he was a worship leader, he was a brother, he was a husband, he was a son, he was a parent. He was a leader. He was a hero. He was a recovered adulterer and a repentant murderer. And he was an ancestor of Jesus Christ. But you know what? When you think of David, the first thing that comes to your mind is not Psalm 51 usually, where he says, Restore to me the joy of my salvation for what I've done against you, against you and you only, God, have I sinned. When you think of David, you don't think first of Psalm 51. Nothing wrong with Psalm 51. Powerful, right? And listen to what I'm about to say. I'm not encouraging the sins of David's life and I'm not encouraging you to continue to sin in whatever sins are in your life. What I'm saying is don't be defined by them. Get past them. You don't think of Psalm 51 when you think of David. You think of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. You think of Psalm 23 when you think of David. You think of David killing Goliath. You think of David the king. You think of David the leader. You don't think of David the adulterer and murderer, although he did those things. But you know what? 
He chose not to be that version of himself any longer. And he chose to be the best version of himself. It's a choice. You've got to make a choice today. You can choose to be defined by this world's version of you, by your past's version of you, or you can choose to be defined by God's version of you. God told Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, he said, Abraham, I want you to leave, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house. Now, maybe you've heard me talk about this before, but this is, let me help you to understand, God's not against family. God's not against loving relationships and loving our family members. But Abram was from a family of nomads. They would go from village to village that somebody had already planted the seed and harvested the crops, and the nomads would go in there as scavengers and eat whatever was left over and, leave and live by what was, whatever was left over by somebody else. And that was the pattern in Abraham's family's lives. And so God said to Abraham, I don't want you living like your father did. I don't want you to hang around them anymore because they are trying to put an impression on you and they are trying to define you by your past. They're trying to define you and confine you to a life that is just like theirs. But I want to bring you out to something so much more. I've got something greater for you. He said, leave that old impression. Leave those old definitions of yourself. Leave those old boundaries of yourself. Leave those, those old caged images of who your parents were and how you grew up and what the teacher said about you or what the doctor said about you or what your husband said about you or your wife said about you or what you've said about yourself or what the devil said about you. Leave them behind and go to the land that I will show you. And look at what he says in verse 2. And I will make you great. I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. You shall be a blessing. But listen, folks, you can't just think that it's going to happen just because God said he did it for Abraham. Yes, he will do it for you, but Abraham had to make a choice. Is he going to stay defined by his parents' definition, or is he going to be redefined by God's definition? And every one of us has to make that choice, and we got to say, I choose to be the best version of myself, and I'm going to go feed on wherever I'm going to learn about the best version of myself. I'm going to life changers to understand the best version of who I am. I'm not hanging around I'm not, I'm not going to hang around the negative. I'm not going to hang around the naysayers. I'm not going to hang around the accusers, the critics, the critiques, those that have nothing good to say and those that are filled with negativity and those that are disgruntled and those that are full of, of what they're mad about because they're victims in this life when God has created us to be victors, not victims. And I'm telling you right now, Abraham said, I'm taking God's path. I'm choosing God's, God's version of me. I'm choosing the Spirit's version of me, not the flesh. Amen. Amen. And he became a great nation. I will bless you, and I'll make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And those that bless you, I will bless. Those that curse you, that's the harvest they're going to get. You know, I don't fight what people say about me. So if you ever hear something negative about me and I don't fight about it, learn why. Because I don't need to. Amen, amen. Because I'm not fighting for reputation. I'm fighting for souls. I want lives changed. I want the gospel preached. I want people to come to meet Jesus. I want the power of the Holy Spirit. And I don't give a hoot about what anybody else has to say because I'm not choosing their version of me. I'm choosing God's version of me. Amen. And that's what you have to do. you got to choose God's version of you, not, not the past. I was a drug dealer and an alcoholic by the time I was 16 years old. But I'm not defined by that. Amen. You don't define me by that. Why? Because, oh, well, you got born again. Yet... There are a lot of people that fail after getting saved. They still fail. They stumble. We all have fallen. We all have stumbled after we got saved. But God loved us before we got saved and didn't allow our past to define us. So why are we going to allow anything that has happened since we got saved to define us? Now, some of us here are very holy people. Pray for us unholy ones. 
<laughs> Some of us here are very holy people and we we wish, come on, pastor, preach against my wife's sin, preach against my husband's sin, preach against all the sin in this world. No, Jesus, I'm preaching for something, not against something. Jesus took the sin of the world and he nailed it to the cross. We, we have to get rid of self-righteousness like, come on, I, I just want you to say how bad things are. Yes, sin is bad. And that's why Jesus died for it. Amen. Well, people are bad and my husband's bad. Tell him he's going to get a harvest off of his bad seeds. OK, your husband's going to get a harvest off of his bad seeds or you could pray for a crop failure for your husband's bad seeds and show mercy and show mercy. If if we weren't here to receive, I, I'm just we're snowed in. That's why I haven't. <laughs> That's why I haven't dismissed yet. Where, I mean, where, where are we going, really, right? I mean, come on. But we're all, I call it, we're, we're all victims of God's mercy and God's grace. We're not victims of what people have done to us. I'm not a victim of that. I'm a victim of God's grace. I've been victimized by his grace. Therefore, whatever anybody else has done to me, it pales, it fails, it will not prevail. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You got to choose the best version of yourself. I'm choosing today. How about you? Amen. What does that version look like? Are you somebody who prays more or better? Are you closer to God? What's that version? What's that best version of yourself? Are you a kind husband? Are you a, a loving, godly wife? Are you a successful business person? Are you a serving volunteer in your church? What is that best version of yourself? Are you somebody that can say, I failed, I blew it, but, that, but God did not confine me to the prison of my past. He does not define me by that. I admit it. You see, we can't live in denial like we never did it. Admit it. You did it. But God says, I'll be merciful to you if you humble yourself. This is the grace of God, is that we can choose the best version of ourselves. I'm choosing today. What does that best version look like? We need to value ourselves and mine out the best that is within us. And if you're struggling with something right now, pray through it. Worship Jesus through it. Remember the man who came across the cocoon of the emperor moth? One day, the moth will become a beautiful creature with its wings marked with red and orange. But anxious to see the moth emerge from its cocoon, the man took the underdeveloped cocoon home. And for several hours he watched as the moth struggled to break out of the cocoon. But it seemed to him as if it had gotten stuck, so he took a knife and cut off the remaining bit of the shell, allowing the moth to go free. The problem was that the wings were shriveled and undeveloped. And the little moth never was able to thrive, but soon died. What the man in his, in his misguided kindness and haste had failed to understand was that this moth was created to emerge from its cocoon only when, through its struggle, it developed enough strength in its wings to survive, a process that was timed perfectly by God. Freedom and flight would only come once the moth had learned to fly inside the cocoon. Then he would be able to fly on the outside. But when we're struggling, we want everybody to free us from our struggle. And God wants us to praise him through it, Amen. worship him through it. 
Speak the word through it because that produces the strength that your spiritual wings need to be able to fly. Let's stand together.